ladies and gentlemen, this is Trisha with Insectopia, and I am so happy that you are here with me today. I was seeing Susan already in the chat, um, got confirmation that Dung Beetle sounds like a good idea. I thought that this guy would be a whole lot of fun to sketch, and we can start from the head. <coughs> We can do um, we can do its entire dorsal part of its body, but I really want to make sure that at some point we actually flip this beetle over and look at its underside because there's all types of cool like um, colorations and stuff happening down there. And um, I was thinking that um, it's better to look at the head from a lateral point of view because this one is actually a male and has horns. I'll show you really quick. Uh, the horns aren't great in that picture. I'll have to um, show you in re real time. Um, they've got these really awesome horns. Um, so obviously we know he is a boy. I would love to see that too, Susan, being able to watch an entire thing of elephant dung being picked up. I feel like that is a crazy task because I assume elephant dung is a, is a whole lot. Um, I was actually in Texas when I got, um, when I got rained into a canyon and um, couldn't get out, needed to wait for the bulldozers to come clear the road. So uh, after the rain had finally ended, I got out of the car and started looking for bugs, as you do in Texas, right? And there were dung beetles rolling dung, um, like across the street and stuff, because I guess they become more active right after the rain, especially because it was so dry there at the moment. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Yeah, so that's awesome. Oh, and hi, Deb! Welcome back. All right, so dung beetles are actually a type of scarab beetle. Um, scarabs are a very large family of beetles. Um, so if you were going to say, if we were going to say family, you would have scarabaeidae. <laughs> and I love scarabaeidae because you get three vowels in a row. And um, I've always thought it was one of those, like, fun names to say because, um, and to write. Look at all those vowels. So, um, all scarabs are in the family scarabaeidae, and so are these beautiful little dung beetles here. Um, now, dung beetles, you can take this down one further and still have only dung beetles. So, you can turn it into a subfamily family rather than a family. So let me go ahead and write subfamily by just changing this D to an N. Scarabaeini. Um, and that is the subfamily that this dung beetle is in. That's the subfamily that we consider. They call it the true dung beetles because there are other species of beetles that eat dung that aren't in this subfamily. Um, but yes, great name on both accounts because the family and the subfamily names are wonderful. And they're easy to remember because they're the scarabs and it starts with scarab. Yes, exactly. So if it ends in D-A-E, a lot of times it's, you even add the I in there. If it ends in I-D-A-E, then it's a family. And if it ends in I-N-A-E, then it's a subfamily. The next step down, and I'm not sure that this specimen in general is in this tribe, but you can go tribe and all tribes end in I-N-I. So that would be the next step in the um, entomological uh, world out there. So it goes family, subfamily, tribe, and then genus, species. There is a mushroom with a similar name. That's cool. So I'm going to leave it at true dung beetle. That's going to be subfamily scarabaeini. So I'm going to go ahead and write that on my paper. Um, derp. Dung beetle. I started writing scarab. Scarab. 
And this beetle is really gorgeous. It has, um, once we zoom in, you'll see it's, um, slightly iridescent. Yeah, so if you look at this leg picture, um, this is a picture from my microscope, and it has these really, really beautiful iridescence on the pronotum, and this does follow all the way through up into the head, too. So when we zoom in, it's gonna be awesome. I'm excited about it. I will go ahead and tell you where it was collected. Oh, this was from, okay. So, <laughs> I loved staying at this campground. Um, I collected this dung beetle in Kitake, Texas at a state park. Um, it's called Cap Rock State Park, and it is the only herd they, they home the only herd of bison in Texas. And so from where I was camping, from where my tent was, um, I could actually hear the bison down below, like, playing in the river. It was wild. So that night I set up a black light, and this beautiful dung beetle came to me. He was probably smelling all of the uh, buffalo dung. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and measure our specimen here from the front of the head to the end of the elytra. Oh, look at that. Aww. He is 1.01 centimeters. 1.01 centimeters. He's so cute. Um, there's definitely another dung beetle I'm excited to share with you, but it's not pinned yet. So, once it's pinned, you'll be able to see it. Alright, so I'm gonna start this head, um, I'm gonna start this head with this line here, and keep in mind, you can see that the head kind of widens out towards the horns before coming back in. So we're gonna try and get this shape on our paper. Now, um, keep in mind that if you are sketching along with me, um, you wanna make sure that our first sketch is really light, because we are likely going to be erasing a good number of the lines when we come back and we zoom in and we check out our, our specimen. Now, um, I actually just remembered that I wanna sketch mine kind of small, because I have this idea of um, adding some of the body parts around my specimen. So we've got, the head gets nice and wide first, and then it's going to arch over this. Now, um, I see that there's a little divot on the top of the head, but I think that I'm just going to leave it straight for now so that when I'm up there, um, I'll be able to kind of find the center of the line. I think it'll help me keep centered to just do it round first. To make sure that this right side comes out a little wider. There we go. All right, so I've got a head started, and then behind the head, we are going to be adding a pronotum. The pronotum does come up a little bit around the head, so we're going to kind of spike it up like this, but it does kind of align with also where that angle ends on your head. So if you were going to follow this angle of the head down, you could almost give yourself an outline of where you wanted your pronotum to be. Now, um, the pronotum is right about here, and it gets nice and wide to about this point across, and then it's going to arch back down. And I do believe there's a little bit of a point down here at the very center end of the pronotum, so I'm going to go ahead and get that. Um, I'm going to round out my edges first just to make sure I'm keeping them mostly even before I go to, let's see. No, I need this one to come more like this. And I'll be able to 
change this when I zoom in if I see anything that needs to have different angles. So I'm going to pull these in. Make sure you're keeping in mind that central line here. You're working over a line of symmetry. Sometimes I do sketch it on my paper and sometimes I just kind of freehand it. Um, it might be helpful for you to put a line on the center of your paper. Now the end of the pronotum is going to come to a little bit of a point, but it's not going to be too sharp. So you want to kind of flatten it out a little bit. I made mine even a little sharp the first time. All right. And I'm going to erase that center line on the pronotum. I don't think I'm going to need it, but having it on the head is going to be good for me to get my horns in. And then down here in the elytra, obviously, as we are finishing out these wings, that'll be helpful. So now that we are looking at giving ourselves an outline for the elytra or these wings down here, I'm going to look at right about where this Y for my pronotum ends and starts curving back. And that is going to be where our elytra are going to come out of. <clears throat> Just make sure that that's even on each side. And my picture will morph and change as we get closer to it. Very good. All right, so that works for me. And then we're just going to round these out a little bit. Um, my goal, let's go ahead and check some ratios here. From the head to the end of the pronotum, it is 0.59 centimeters. But then from the end of the pronotum to the end of the elytra, it is 0.4 centimeters. So your elytra are going to be just a little bit shorter than the combined length of the head and the pronotum. So you can do that with a ruler, or you can do that with, a, uh, um, with your hands. And I said just a little bit under. Hey, you got a little short little elytra here. So that's this is going to be my mark for the end of the elytra. And then I'm going to make sure that this line, I had started arching it so it's going to be too long, kind of just comes down and meets that, meets that point here. A little too far out, a little too far in, right in the center. We get right about here is where I'm thinking. Yeah. And then I'm going to just try and match this left side to the right side. And then take this central line here, this point, and I'm going to give myself this, which is the edge of our elytra. Now, we are getting somewhere. We have our head, our thorax is actually this whole section and then two more segments. The abdomen on this dung beetle is incredibly tiny. Um, I'm excited to show you because the segments are like doop, 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 um, a lot thinner than uh, normal specimens. Now, uh, we, oh, let me go ahead and get those, uh, those measurements off our screen here. All right. Um, I'm going to look at our leg shape here. And what we're looking at here is actually the tibia. Um, the femur is pretty short and stubby, so you can't really see it. Um, on the middle leg, you can almost see it. It's that little wide guy right there before it bends here. So that little guy right there is the femur. And then this wide one here is the tibia. And then that's the same for down here. You can see the edge of the tibia and maybe a little corner of the femur, but that's about it. And then we are going to be able to sketch all of the tarsal segments and, um, Dung beetles and other scarab beetles have crazy looking tarsal segments, and I'll be able to explain that to you too when we get there. So, all of that to say, let's get, um, you know what, we probably don't need an outline of the legs on these guys. We're probably just going to be using these shapes. Let's zoom in and check out the head. All right. <clears throat> so with our head, I want to look at it for
from a dorsal point of view just so that you can see kind of the angles you're trying to sketch from above but this is a really tricky sketch so I want to make sure we also look at it from a side point of view so that you can see how fun and awesome the horns are. You can also kind of see, I wonder if we zoomed in a little bit more if you would be able to see some of the iridescence up here. So there's definitely some iridescence up here on the horns. Um, I do have this picture from the side so we can show it off. Oh, I can even turn it for you. Let's see. Wee! All right, so this is a lateral point of view of our dung beetle's head. And um, there's something kind of fun about it. I'll show you really quick. Where did, where did Terry go? Terry, come back. All right. Um, so this right here is the compound eye. And you can see all of the omatidia or all of the little individual lenses above and below what looks like this kind of weird face shelf. <laughs> and that's exactly, well, that's what we call it. We call it kind of, we call it a shelf. Um, and it's an expansion of the head and it goes kind of over the eye, but the eye isn't cut off by it. The eye does exist underneath that shelf. And I've always thought that that was kind of funny because um, I wonder like if the brain of this beetle just doesn't take into account those eyes because they never see anything or if they do have like different sensory abilities because they're completely blocked off from the rest of the world. Uh, and then here are our horns, but I'm going to have to show you the horns underneath the microscope when we turn it sideways. Then you'll see it a little bit better. So just from the top, ha! Huh. All right, just from the top, I do have this central line here. And so I, little tiny cute Tarsi, yes. Um, so right about here, I'm looking at the, um, at the horns, the top of the horns of this beetle. And something that I'm noticing now that we're nice and zoomed in is that the head does go straight just for a moment before it arches over and out. So I'm going to make sure that at least the very base of my head starts straight up and down like a vertical line. Um... And that is where I'm going to start kind of my darker lines as I'm finalizing this. So I'm going to start it right around there. And then I want to get my outside of my head shape. So I'm happy with where I angled these. I'm going to go ahead and darken those. I do want to make sure that our head looks a little bit like a shelf because you saw it very, it very much is shelf-like. And uh, when we flip this beetle over and you see the underside of its mouth parts, they're awesome. I wanted to just focus down a little bit so you can see that it's not a cleft in the lip, but um, so you can see that little arch or that little cutout. So once you get up to a point like this, you want to make sure you start just a really, not that big, a really slight U right here in the very center. Stay true to the specimen. Now, um, on this guy, you can't even see the antenna from above. Um, we do have the ability to see the antenna from below. Um, yeah, we can see the antenna from below. Uh, and I believe that if its antenna were stretched straight out, you probably could see the antenna from above, but only like the little short clubs on the end. Probably not much more than that. All right, so I've got my head shape all taken care of, and I'm actually pretty happy with this. I'm going to change the focus of our, uh, of our microscope really quick because I wanted to see where the head connects to the pronotum. I've uh, avoided doing dung beetles because I know their head is on, or their body is on so many levels, but I think that we've got this. So I wanted to add, at least right here, I'm noticing that there's an arch that comes up towards the head, and I want to make sure I give that some space and some consideration when I am doing the horns. So right about where, right about where our head 
um, goes out rather than going straight up. That's about where I'm going to be placing my horns. And I want to make sure that they are at least even along that central line here. And they almost look like they're coming up. I've never actually, I don't know if I've drawn a, um, a, a pyramid from above, but what I want to do is kind of create a very small square in the center and then like a, I don't know, I'm working on it. Something like this. Well, we know, we know that uh, these horns are here. And then our compound eyes are um, just below. So I'm going to go ahead and focus down just a little bit. Right there, you can see where the compound eyes are. They're off here to the edge. One's right about here, and the other one is right around here. So if you are taking your sketch, we have these horns, and then ooh, off to the left, and off to the right. That's going to be where their compound eyes are. Although we know that there's also that shelf that's going to block off that... Um, block off this segment here. So let's see. Let's go ahead and fix that. <clears throat> because the shelf comes down towards the eye and then you have the actual eye and then it continues on. So something like this where you have a point that's coming up kind of above the eye. Let me fix my other side. So like this where you've got a little bit of a point that comes over the eye and this is going to be our compound eye right in here oh he's so cute that's fine all right let's uh let's turn our specimen so that we can see the head from a lateral point of view I do remember this about playing with him under the microscope. His uh, his depth is a little interesting to work with because this beetle is thick. All right, so um, from the side, I, w I just wanted you to be able to see those horns so that you had an idea of what they look like from the side too. Um, and you can see that the that that flat disc of a mouth almost stays flat the entire way. So if we wanted over here. I might go ahead and give myself a really light sketch of like, all right, we had one horn here, and that horn kind of has this continuous line that comes about down a little bit. And then we have a circle that hugs the eye and goes back. So that's a sclerite. And then inside... This comes up, but it also comes over, and this is where our compound eye is, except that it has that shelf, man, that kind of overlaps on top, and comes down, very narrow, very thin. And scoops around. All right, let me finish this compound eye here, because it's going to protrude below that. And then kind of continue on to the mouth parts. So if we wanted to give ourselves, I'm actually pretty happy with this, so I'm going to darken it up a little bit. Um, this is what our friend kind of looks like from a lateral point of view. And then if I was going to sketch this out into the distance, I might go ahead and give myself, let's see, I'm right around here.
a second horn back here. And then the rest of the face, I wanted to make sure I could get the rest of this kind of flat. And there's a whole lot of mouth parts happening down there. So I'm just going to close it off like this. And when we look at it from a ventral point of view, we'll be able to add some of these mouth parts. But that is about what I think I'm going to be able to do for now. And so that's what the the lateral version of our head looks like. All right, let's look at the pronotum. All right, so the top and central areas of the pronotum are this metallic green color, and then the edges of the pronotum are kind of lined in orange. And if you see all of those little punctations or those little dots in the pronotum, I do believe that there are hairs coming out of all of those little dots. So cool little factoids as we're sketching. Um, our arch is going to come up. Make sure you're just aligning it. right about there so that it's coming up. I didn't want to pull it up as far as I did the first time. Um, the uh, widest part of your pronotum looks like it's in the second third. The trickiest thing is making sure that you are staying symmetrical. At least for me. All right, much better. So I've got the edges of my pronotum. I do want to make sure that I continue rounding out. I think that when I got to this point um, in my sketch, I flattened out a little bit too much. I really made a Y, and I want to make sure that this stays a little bit more rounded. So I did go inside of this Y. Why, why? Oh, I love it, though. I love it so much. And so we can absolutely cover this with little punctations. I'm going to just put a couple on here with my pencil just to remind me that when I'm coming back and doing it with ink, I want to make sure that this has um, fine punctations. And then I want to, I do believe that the orange color kind of starts um, right about here. It's dark all the way where the neck is. Um, and then rounds out these entire edges. So you've got a little bit of a color change here. So it could be cool to outline that. Um, and I think that's going to be most of it for the pronotum. So I'm going to scooch ourselves down and we are going to be able to look at the elytra. Hey, chaos! Long time no see! We missed you! It's so cool! All right, so this is the, these are the elytra of our dung beetle here. And you can see that there are, yeah, I wouldn't call these striations. They're not long and straight. They're just um, punctations. They're points in rows, in lines. So I'm going to go ahead and get the outline of my elytra all solid, um, 
all darkened up because I believe I'm pretty happy with the size and shape. Although now that I'm looking at our specimen, you can see a little bit of the abdomen outside of the elytra. And I do believe that's something that would be true for this species because it looks like my specimen is pretty flat. So when I come back here and finalize these lines, I'm going to cut this just a little bit short. Yeah, I'm going to cut it just a little bit short and then add the abdomen after it. Yeah. Yeah, so now I'm going to go back and erase some of these light lines so that my line that I want is a little bit clearer. And you can see that I cut it just a little bit short. So I'm going to erase some of these light lines and then add just a little bit of a sliver of an abdomen outside of the elytra. I think that that will add realism to our specimen, to our sketch. All right, so we're going to sketch, I think I plan on doing the left legs because then when I flip it over, I think I'm going to be doing like these types of smaller sketches along the right side. Pretty busy. I guess that's good though. Being busy, I think, is generally good. At least for me, I love being busy. zoomed in too far. The viewer on my um, microscope is wider than the view on my camera, so sometimes I accidentally will um, make it too close, because that's how I would look at it on the microscope. Come on, friend. There we go. Now it's moving. All right. So I think that this is an okay image of the leg, but I have a better one. So we're just going to use this one. It is a picture of this exact specimen. Um, it's just with a, uh, and that's funny because I can actually align it. Wow. It came up pretty much aligned to the head there. Look at that. That's cool. All right, so um, we're going to be sketching from this picture because it's a little clearer. Um, if you want, we can look at where the legs are coming out from underneath the pronotum, though. That might be important for us. So let me zoom out just a skosh. Skoosh. Just a little itty, itty bitty bit. All right, so our leg is going to be coming out from right around here where this widest point of our pronotum is. And the inside of the leg is this nice arch. And it's going to stop. It's going to align a little bit after the head. So I'm just going to use those use those markers right here at around the edge of the head and keep this night line nice and arched. I'm happy with that. So this, this um, piece here, this tibial spine spur, spine spur, that it has a joint and does have the ability to move. We talked about this last week. Is this a true dung beetle? Yes, it is. In the family Scarabaeini. All right, so I'm rounding out that edge here. This is actually the edge of the tibia. And I'm going to come down and out. I 
just want to get this um, this outline of the tibia finished first. So make it come out like this. And then you do have a series of four um, of four shapes, waves on the uh, on the head or on the leg. Sorry guys. Derp. I'm just trying to make sure I don't make it too big because we are looking at that. Um, I'm going to shrink this really quick. Yeah. I want to make sure we're not making it too big because we're looking at a really nicely zoomed in image. Yeah. That'll help. One, two, and then the third one's a little bit shorter, and then the fourth one is the smallest yet, and then it finishes off. But I need to make sure that those arches come all the way back to about here. So I'm going to have to try that one more time. Let's see. One. You know what? I know what I'm going to do. To make this easier on myself, I'm going to take this line here and I'm going to make, you're going to laugh at me, I'm just going to take where I would normally go and go, this is the tibia, it's this wide at the beginning and I want it to go to about this wide at the end and that's going to give me my overall shape and then I'm going to create the U's off of this shape. I think that this is going to make it a little bit easier for me and if it's easier for me you can go ahead and try it too if you're having difficulties. I'm going to create this first arch here that's going to be one and then I'm going to pull it just a little bit under that line before coming back up for number two. And keep in mind, these U's can stay pretty wide, too. Now, number three is going to be even larger yet. And then four, we, it's okay that we're pretty close to the end of the tibia, because four is going to come out and then is going to just kind of end here. And for me, that's going to that's gonna help every time, kind of being able to see the center line, especially when I'm doing things like arches or like feathery antenna and those types of things. And I might come back and kind of level off and even things, but it definitely gives me a, a nice place to be, I think. We'll see what happens. All right, all scarab beetles have the tarsal formula 444. Four, four. So you'll see that each of these um, tarsal segments, they're four, tar four segmented. So we've got that, um, this kind of guy here. <clears throat> and then there's three, three uh, smaller rectangular segments, like uh, one, two, three. And then the fourth one is nice and long, and you've got those claws on the end. Tarsal claws! And that gives us leg number one. Yay! <clears throat> <coughs> if you wanted, you could add some of those really pretty golden hairs, especially to the end of the tibia, and then and the beginnings of each of these um, loops. I feel like those... Those make me happy, so I'm going to add some of them. And I might add some hairs around in the pronotum, just so that I remember that they exist there. All right. I got the outline of the elytra done, and then just completely skipped the punctations and the lines and finishing the center. Sorry, guys. So I just want to look at the legs from this angle so that you can see what we're sketching and then when we turn it over you can sketch whichever way you'd like. So did you know that the um, 
They may have come up with something stronger, but the last time that I checked, the strongest animal on the planet, um, in comparison to its size, was a, is a, is a dung beetle in the species Anthophagus taurus. And I believe that it can be found in Africa. And it has the ability to, I believe it's pull. I believe it has the ability to pull 1,141 times its own body weight. Um, and so that is super duper duper impressive. And if you wanted to see how much you could pull if you were that dung beetle, all you would have to do is take your weight and multiply it by 1,141 pounds um and you would find out how many um how much you could lift i think i did this a little bit earlier and then did a little bit of extra math and discovered that if i was this species of dung beetle i would be able to pull 15 giraffes and elephants it was i did it in elephants i'd be able to pull 15 elephants on a cart like that's impressive All right, so this femur is kind of wide, and it's coming out from right about here, but I'm going to make sure that it is not too long because it stays pretty much underneath the specimen. And then our tibia is only going to be about halfway down the elytra, so right around here before, let's see, we are chop. And just like on the top leg, I'm going to give myself a central line and then give myself those spines. So like this guy, one, two, three big ones, and then the angle at the end. So that's going to give me my shape for the tibia. And these uh, tarsal segments... Wait a minute. formula except that when we're looking at this front leg I think we actually have to flip the leg upside down to see the first segment because it's very very small so when I was here looking at the Looking at the middle legs tarsal formula, I was noticing that there are five tarsal segments here rather than four. And I did know that they had the same number of tarsal segments. I just, you know, miscounted. I just went to double check. All right. So, our first tarsal segment is that nice long rectangle, but keep in mind, we are pretty zoomed in. Um, the next three segments look more triangular, like they could fit into one another. One. 
and they get significantly smaller until you get to the very end, which almost looks like a little peg leg. And I can imagine that if you're walking on the top of your middle leg like that, if you were actually rolling dung, that might be helpful. Now, not all dung beetles roll dung. And because I didn't see this dung beetle rolling a dung pile, I'm not sure if it was, if it is a dung roller or is one of the two other forms of dung beetles. So we can talk about that. Um, let's get our, let's get our legs started and then we'll go. So our hind leg is going to, we're going to see that, um, that femur coming up right here at probably a little bit above the widest point of our elytra here. So that's going to give us our starting point. And then our tibia is going to be coming back up out towards us. So with that said, I was going to go back to the story I was about to tell you, but I have forgotten. Oh, yes. The, um, I get so excited about bugs that I forget what I'm going to tell you. Um, it's the, uh, the three different types of dung beetles out there. So let's see. I want to make sure that my tibia is about as long as the end of this about here. And then we're going to have a little bit of a socket here because this is actually a flexible joint. And then the uh, tibia from this viewpoint, you can actually see kind of like the opening of the tibia here towards us. And then we've got two series of spines up here. So I'm going to make sure that I've got these guys coming off the top. And then I give myself another row of spines that are fairly close that stay in a row here. Um, so... Uh, not only are there rolling dung beetles, there are also dung beetles that we call dwellers, and those are dung beetles that their eggs just get laid in a in a in a patty or some or some dung, and the grubs just live in the dung, and there's no rolling involved. Just lay egg in poop, let babies take care of themselves. Um, so those are what we call the dwellers. There are also um, dung beetles that we call the tunnelers and the tunneler dung beetles will spend their time um digging underneath dung so if you imagine these little beetles they're go they go under and they dig under the dung and then the dung drops just a little bit into the ground and then they dig under it again and then it goes under the ground and these dung beetles will tunnel under the dung until the dung is underground and buried <laughs> and then they will lay their eggs on this like buried piece of dung um they bury dung very much like burying beetles will bury dead animals I do believe the hind leg has some pretty strict tarsal claws. So let me go and check that out, make sure I'm right. Yeah, so it's a little bit more difficult to see from this angle, but there you can see kind of the shiny sharp point there. There are tarsal claws at the end of those hind legs. Something like that. All right, so I want to get the elytra finished because I've got all of these legs now. Yay! And I admittedly, I think that my front leg is still a little bit too big, or my hind legs might be a little small. I don't know. It looks very, my beetle looks a little bit top-sided, top, top-heavy to me. But maybe that's just the way it is. Maybe, uh, oh, maybe the front leg needs to be narrower. All right. What if a dweller lays an egg in some dung and then a roller comes along and wants to roll it? Oh, that's so funny. I'm sure it happens. I wonder if the dung beetles... I wonder if the grubs just live in a roll. 
I wouldn't think that they would have enough space because the uh, dwellers, they like to really tunnel within the dung. That's a great question. I have no idea what happens in that situation. I want to zoom in a little bit. Look at all those punctations. All right. So there is this dark band in the center of our elytra here. So I'm going to first start off by darkening that center line and say, all right, that's where it is. And now I'm going to come along the edges and I'm not going to make it as dark as that line, but I do want to kind of graphite in the very center because that's some pretty dark, that's a pretty dark dark here. All right, now um, we do have a series of punctations, and if we wanted to count, we can, so why not? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, possibly an eighth one on the end. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Let's go look if there's an eighth one. Yes. No, seven, just seven. Yeah. It's um, seven lines of stripes down the beetle's body. You can start here and be have one stripe that's pretty close to this edge here and then you want to go out a little bit and the rest of these they look apparent they're apparently pretty even um but they do kind of round back towards the center so if you go one two three four five six seven. i wanted to make sure that i knew where my my rows were gonna be and making sure they were even so i went ahead and did that and then I'm just going to come along down and add all of these punctations and nice little lines. And I am making sure that they arch towards the end, but I'm not making sure that they come all the way to this point. See that? So I created this arch and then I followed through on all sides. And I'm going to do the same thing on the other side. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So I have the seven that are distributed and I know that they are the right length apart from each other. And then I'm just going to come in here. Oops. That one decided to stray off the path a little bit. No straying off the path. And ideally, your last line is going to end right about here at the widest point of the elytra. Oof. That's a really awesome so far, and I'm happy with this sketch here too. Maybe a roller needs fresh dung. That might make sense that like a um that a dweller is going to be find it a little bit later than maybe a roller would. Um, it's also possible, and I'm not sure that this is the case, but um, I think that it's also possible that the um, rollers would be able to sense via pheromones or sense that there are already dung beetles in that dung. I'm not sure if multiple dung beetle species ever, sh I'm sure that they do. They do, because I've seen pictures of that happening. Never mind. And if they're all attacking the dung at the same time, there definitely can be eggs within the dung that the rollers are rolling. I've seen pictures of multiple species of dung beetles attacking one dung. I have not ever seen it myself in person. Um, I've only ever seen one species at a time. Well, 
Look at how beautiful this dung beetle is. I l absolutely love the colorations on the femurs under here. So you can see, you can what we saw were the tibia, but you couldn't see these really strong looking epic femurs down here. Um, this little triangle that this femur is connected to, and then this little odd shaped pizza shape, those are the coxal segments or the coxy of this beetle. Um, and we have to look at the bottom side of the face because there are all types of really awesome and cute mouth parts down here. Let's see. My parents had an old leather chair with studs that looked like this. <laughs> Is it actually made of leather? Oh, that's funny. mouth parts I don't know how much how much of the individual mouth parts we're gonna be able to point out but here are some of the things I can show you these are the compound eyes of our specimen underneath the shelf here just like we had um, just like we had seen before when we looked at it from above and from a lateral point of view um, so in my head I feel like um, you can Feel free to argue either way, I'm not sure. But I feel like if you, if this was a, and here's the other thing, I'm not sure what type of dung beetle this one is, whether it was a roller or a dweller or a tunneler. But if this one was a roller and it was up in the air, it could in theory use the bottom side of its eyes to lo to watch the ball and the top front of the eyes to um, go watch forward. So it could be that this border here is like its border between I'm looking down versus I'm looking up. That's an interesting thought I've had. The other thought I've had was that it's possible that it's shading that side of the eye. <laughs> that, like, what if um, that big scoop-like face was actually, like, a big, um, like, a shade cloth for the bottom side of their compound eyes? I'm not sure why that would be a thing, but um, those are just thought processes I've had while I was checking the specimen out. Um, one of, uh, Chaos mentioned, um, dung beetles being associated with royalty, and the dung beetle god from Egypt, its name was Kepri, and it was the goddess of, uh, rebirth, or sometimes people say of life, and I was really hoping to see some mouth parts. All right, so I'm not seeing very mouth parts. I'm mostly seeing right about here, you've got some like um, palps, and um, this is the base of the antenna. D um, dung beetles have three segmented clubbed antenna. And so there was a moment that we talked about the difference between a club and a knob. Um, but this is like a perfect example of a club. So you can see that the last three segments, they by themselves create this big knob, and all of the other segments look significantly different. In comparison to a knob, where it looks like all of the segments just gradually get larger towards the end. That's our difference. Now, Kepri, sorry, I wanted to get that out. Um, so Kepri was the goddess of rebirth and of life, and they... Um, you know, these ancient Egyptians, they're watching this big pile of dung, right? And then all of a sudden, dung beetles start emerging out of the dung. And they've always seen dung as kind of without, like, kind of waste or without any use or without any purpose. Kind of just like garbage. They didn't really think about it as a food source for anything. So when they saw these dung beetles emerging out of the poop, they just thought like, oh my goodness, they're like being born again. You know, they're, they're like, um, they're like coming out of nowhere. Um, and they have the ability to turn like nothing into something, you know, cause they just thought poop was nothing. 
All right, so um, now that we are looking at the, um, what would we call this? We would call this section the mesosternum, if you want a new word. Meso meaning middle or referring to the second se segment of the thorax. And notum means the top and sternum means the bottom. So when you say mesosternum, you are talking about this big plate here on the bottom of our beetle. <laughs> I think that if you look at this leg, this leg, the top of the mesonotum and then the bottom of the mesonotum, it looks like a praying mantis head. Um, let me show you that. I, I don't know if you can see that. Like a cat-eyed mantis where they've got these real nice big eyes here and then it comes down. And then it also has what looks like these mandibles off to the side, which are just the femurs of the hind legs. But this, if you want to, you know, as I'm talking about this animal and thinking about how I would nature journal it, I would say this reminds me of a praying mantis head. Or a cat eye mantis um, and that's the ventral or the bottom side. So, okay, I told you we were going to see the end of the abdomen and how cute and adorable it is because look how tiny. As like a little kid, I never would have guessed that the abdomen could be so small in comparison to the body because I always figured that the abdomen started way up here when I was a kid. And so to learn that and then to see something like this where you have, I believe they are five segmented abdomens. One, two, three, four. I mean, that makes it look like six. I know that all scarab beetles have the same number of abdominal segments. Well, I thought so. Maybe not. Not sure anymore. So it looks like our dung beetle here, if I was just to believe what I was seeing, I would believe it has one, two, maybe it's striped. No, each one of those stripes are sclerite or are their own separate piece. So I would call this, I would call this one one, two, three, four, five. I would say that this one has six abdominal segments. I'm right, it does look like a mantis head. How fun is that? All right, I'm actually, I'm pretty happy with how my, um, my beetle is. I thought I might add the antenna onto this lateral he head up here. So the antenna connects underneath the head, and I believe... One, two, three, four, five. One, two. You could convince me otherwise, but one, two, three, four, five. All right. I believe it is one, two, three three <coughs> and then four of the 
that's coming towards us, five that's going towards the club, and then three at the end. So I'm going to add that right around here to my lateral head, and then I'm going to be done sketching this guy. So that is coming out. It almost looks like right underneath the eyes, so right here where my, um, my head kind of starts to wrap around, this is where the antenna is going to come out. And I'm going to have the first one, like, around this. Let's see if I can get it about the right size. It's going to, it's kind of small. One, two, three, four, five. And then the three-segmented club. One. Two, three. Something like that. He's so cute. What else did I have? I had this picture of the leg. <clears throat> I had this picture of the body. And then I had this picture of the head. So we got to see all of them. Good. Good, good, good. And from this, you can actually see um, up here, I believe that those are mouth palps. Those are palps up here. Alrighty, I hope that everyone is doing well and that um, Sarah, Deb, and Chaos, you've all enjoyed your time today chatting about dung beetles and insect taxonomy and the endings on them and um, getting a couple of you different viewpoints at this beautiful beetle here. Um, I am getting low on batteries so i think i might be heading off for today so you can go ahead and um if you have any questions you can go ahead and shoot them this towards me but if not we'll go over to our live stream closer i hope that you all have having a had a wonderful time sketching with me um keep in mind that i do teach on a platform called out school out school is a platform where um for students ages 5 to 8 9 to 12 you can say school age where school age kids can come and meet other bug nerds and we talk about a new insect every week and actually it was the dung beetle this week so I already had the specimen under the microscope. It's what made it easy. Um, keep in mind, please subscribe to my channel. All of you out there who are, um, all of you out there who are, um, chatting with me, I really appreciate that because I do know that you are subscribed to my channel because only subscribers get to chat. Um, we also have down here, that's a little place for PayPal, that's just a little place where you can tip me for, um, where you can tip me for class. If you learned something new, if you had a good time, if you're going to share what you've learned with a partner or a friend, um, go ahead and drop me a coffee. Got a couple dollars for my morning coffee. Um, this is what my sketch looks like in its entirety. I know that some of you like to see it all at once, so there you go. Um, I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. If you want to share your sketch with me, you can go ahead and scan it and put it at, and you can email it to me at trisha at theinsectopia.com, and I look forward to seeing some of your sketches. Now, I mentioned that I was doing this with a with the kiddos today. So our conversation was very similar, except you and I talked for an hour, and my kiddos and I talked for 30 minutes, and we came up with something like this where we got to talk about the life history, the um, antennal segments, and then the difference between tunnelers and rollers, and we did even talk, to, uh, talk about Kepri for a minute and the Egyptians. So... Um, alas, if you know someone who would enjoy that, it's a good time, and the kids get to pull out markers and play with me. So, I hope you all, aww, I love that your kitty is cuddling with you. That is absolutely okay. Um, I hope...
hope you all have a wonderful rest of your night. Um, see some cool bugs. I am missing my cool bugs. Um, and stay buggy. Bye, ladies and gentlemen.